Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar spotlight on the Zero Emission Vehicle Infrastructure Plan. My name is Gladys Hurwitz, and I am a multimodal transportation specialist at the Maryland Department of Transportation and moderator for today's session. Today's webinar is made possible by the Maryland Department of Transportation's Commuter Choice Maryland program, and today's session is being recorded. Here are some quick FAQs for you to help you have the best experience for today's webinar. Make sure to choose the correct audio. Please use the question window for any questions, and we'll also be fielding questions at the end of the presentation. There is also a slide deck and recording, which will be available on our website, commuterchoicemaryland.com. Before we get started on today's spotlight, I'd like to start off by introducing you to Commuter Choice Maryland and share some key program offerings. Commuter Choice Maryland plays a key role in helping to meet the Maryland Department of Transportation's mission by enhancing employer and commuter awareness of the variety of transportation options which includes anything from telework, compressed work week, transit, ride sharing, as well as commuter benefits programs. These options help to balance the transportation demand across our roadways, transit systems, white, walk and bike ways throughout the state. Commuter Choice Maryland also works in partnership with local and regional jurisdictions and provides complementary consultations to employers starting or enhancing their workplace transportation and commuter benefits programs. One of our goals is to make it easy for employees to find affordable, convenient, and sustainable ways to get to work that enhances their quality of life while helping to attract and retain talent. It's really with our key partnerships with local and regional jurisdictions that we're able to provide services and share information on the benefits of transportation options to employers and commuters throughout Maryland. So thank you to all of our partners who may be on the call today. This is a list of strategies used to support transportation demand management. For today, I'm gonna to share a little bit more detail about Incentrip and the Maryland Commuter Tax Credit and the new legislation that just passed recently. Incentrip is a mobile app with the goal of reducing traffic congestion in the weekday peak periods by encouraging Maryland commuters and employers to increase the use of public transportation, ride sharing, walking, biking, teleworking, and also tele uh, alternative work schedules. Maryland commuters who use the application will earn points when they make decisions to avoid congestion, and the points can be redeemed for cash rewards. The Maryland Department of Transportation has partnered with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments and the University of Maryland, Maryland Transportation Institute to expand service coverage from the national capital region to the entire state of Maryland. So to get started, make sure to follow these five easy steps. Download the app, create an account, make sure to register it. So then when you take those trips, you'll also be earning rewards. Plan and take that trip, then start collecting points and redeem for rewards right within the app. It's really that easy. Maryland employers may claim a tax credit for up to 50% of the total eligible cost of commuter benefits offered to employees up to a maximum of $100 per employee per month. The existing qualifying commuter benefits includes subsidized cost of transit, example for employees, emergency ride homes, and also cash in lieu of parking. The Maryland Department of Transportation has championed legislation in the past Maryland session to expand benefits of the Maryland Commuter Tax Credit. The legislation did pass and would go into effect on July 1st, 2022. The new expansion now includes carpool to cover expenses such as easy pass and tolls and fees and parking fees, telework to cover fees such as, or costs such as internet server costs, um, computer equipment costs, telephone equipment costs, and also membership costs for co-working spaces and telework centers. There's also active transportation, which cover the costs associated with bicycle maintenance, bicycle and scooter memberships, bicycling gear and walking gear. And lastly, there's the multimodal last mile solution, where a ride hill service can be used for up to five miles of a multimodal trip to connect a commuter to a non SOV mode of travel to or from work. So be on the lookout for a launch of these new options in July. So we just can't stress enough how all of these efforts are important to 
because they help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reduce congestion, enhance the quality of life of all Marylanders, and increase economic opportunities. To learn more about additional program offerings, please visit our, our website, commuterchoicemaryland.com. So I'd like to now turn the session over to our guest speaker, Dan Janicek, with the Maryland Department of Transportation, who will share information on the Zero Emission Vehicle Infrastructure Plan. Happy to have you, Dan. All right, thank you, Gladys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, what we're gonna do today is give you a, a quick presentation over um, the Maryland uh, Zero Emission Infrastructure Plan, or Uh We'll be presenting this to the Maryland Zero Emission Electrification Infrastructure Vehicle Infrastructure Council um, uh, on May 26th, actually on May 25th. So next slide. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the National uh, Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program and Maryland's Zero Emission Vehicle Infrastructure Plan. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about our public participation efforts to date and include some next steps and where we're going with our plan and program. Okay, so what is the Zero Emission Vehicle Infrastructure Plan and what is the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program? Um, I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna turn my camera off a little bit here so I'm gonna read off some text for you. The, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act the 2JA outlines two new electric vehicle infrastructure programs that will provide funds to help address climate change by reducing carbon emissions. We are here to discuss one of those programs, the National Electric Vehicle Formula Program, or NIV. That requires states to submit an EV infrastructure deployment plan for the formula program by August 1, 2022. The other program will be a discretionary grant program called the Charging and Fueling Infrastructure Program announcements in the fall. But we're going to talk today about it. Um, the state of Maryland will be provided $60 million over the next five years through formula funding for the Federal Highway Administration to be administered by MDOT to deploy vehicle charging infrastructure throughout the state. The charging infrastructure must be used on the AFCs or Alternative Fuel Corps in Maryland and then in communities and we will also be revising our plan um, annually. Um, the first step is to develop the NEVI formula plan and then also then to develop a program that will allow us to um, put some solicitations out to people who are eligible for the program funds. The, um, who is eligible for program funds? States or political subdivisions of states, metropolitan planning organizations, local government units, special purpose districts, public authorities, and transportation with a transportation function, including ports and Indian tribes. In Maryland, the Maryland Department of Transportation will administer the program as an eligible entity. Funds can be applied for by just about anyone, public and private, but they must be show they must show that they can install, operate, maintain charging infrastructure. So think charging companies and public-private partnerships with EV charging experience. Um, at the top of this page, you'll see, you know, the uh, ZEVA, the Maryland Zero Emission Infrastructure Plan, which is going to sort of capture all of these um, areas with alternative fuels in the state as, as a plan element. The NEVI formula plan on the left, where you see the star, um, that is a, a subcomponent, I guess, of our Maryland Zero Emission Infrastructure Plan. And again, that subcomponent has to be submitted to a new office that was set up. It's called the Joint Office. It's a uh, collaboration between the U.S. Department of Transportation and the Department of Energy. Um, again, I mentioned some discretionary funding that we'll know about later in the year. And then um, under this the ZBIT plan too, you see we have other state programs that we've implemented in the past um, with assistance of Maryland Energy Administration. In fact, and the Maryland Department of Environment, such as the VW Settlement, the Clean Fuels Technical Assistance Program, and the Smart Energy Communities and Solar Canopy Grant Program. Other programs, other funding that's available. Um, in fact, there's a lot of different 
funding available for electric vehicle charging that's coming out of the new the new bill. Um, and some of those will be administered by the Department of Transportation, of course, Department of Energy, and the Environmental Protection Agency. All right, let's go on to the next slide, please. So the requirements for the NEVI formula plan program. So for charging infrastructure, the charging infrastructure has to be located on our alternative fuel corridors and cannot be less than 50 miles between stations on the corridor. That's to sort of get our corridors to what they call certified, certified status. Um, the chargers would have to be placed within one mile of an interstate exit or highway intersection on the corridor. Uh, the charging infrastructure must include four combined charging system connectors, type one ports, to simultaneously charge four EVs. The maximum charge power for the DC port should not be below 150 kilowatt and the site power capacity can be no less than 600 kilowatt. So these are going to be DC fast chargers basically um, that are going to have a lot of power requirements. Next slide. So there are seven funding categories. Um, that can be funded uh, with these formula program funds. Uh, the acquisition and installation of EV charging infrastructure. Uh, funds can be used for operating assistance, um, development phase activities, getting the site approved, um, traffic control devices and on-premise signs. We use for data sharing about EV charging infrastructure. Acquisition or installation of traffic control devices in the right of way and mapping and analysis activities. Next slide. So, the NEVI plan components that are required by the Joint Office for the submission by August 1st are here. Um, all of these are required plan elements. So, every state in the nation that's developing a plan to go through the formula funding is developing a plan with these basic components. An introduction, of course, they want to know that the state is uh, prepared and has a strategy for state agency coordination. Maryland does, and I can go into that in a little bit. Um, they want to know if you have a public, what your public engagement strategy is. Of course, the plan has to have vision and goals, has to address contracting issues, existing and future conditions, EVSE deployment, implementation, civil rights and equity considerations, labor and workplace considerations, cybersecurity, and then there's a meeting to have a strategy for program evaluation and discretionary exceptions. Discretionary exceptions means if the state wants to approve an application, the application is for a charging um, bay to be located outside of the one mile requirement from the interstate, or alternative fuel corridor, that would be sort of a discretionary exception. And we can see that there may be a need to get a charger in an area, whether it's a multifamily development, major destination employer, um, that is just a little more than a mile off of the, uh, the, you know, off of the alternative fuel corridor, but that may qualify for an exception. We may be looking at some of those. Next slide, please. So for our, we're going to go a little bit over our public participation and where we've been. Um, MDOT launched a MetroQuest survey and a website um, recently to gather public input and to give people information about the NEVI program in Maryland. Uh, the website is evplan.mdot.maryland.gov, and we'll give it to you later. But our Metro Cut survey launched on the 24th. We've had 210 participants. Many of the participants are um, folks in the charging industry, local government, others who are interested in obtaining formula funding. And um, we got a lot of feedback on our vision and goals, prioritization, and infrastructure siting. The um, survey is still available on our website, which we'll give you a link to later. If somebody's interested and wants to take the survey, they still can. Next slide. Some of the results of the survey so far, um, the question, you know, about prioritization um, was asked um, 
And as you can see here, one of the major concerns people have is the distance to the nearest charging station. Right in the middle there, that's the, the high bar. So 79 people indicated that that is important to them. Um, other, other prioritization criteria that was important, proximity to employment centers. It's the other red line to the left, it's 73 people. I think that was really important and commuting and travel corridors. Other areas, as you can see, um, for prioritization for the location of the chargers, you know, people are looking at the first one over here on the left, um, EV registration density, where there are a lot of EVs, obviously we're gonna need chargers. Um, points of interest and destination is in there. Proximity to residential, I mentioned employment centers. Um, access for environmental justice and rural communities is, is a popular one. And then um, also where existing infrastructure is. But you can see here, we're gathering information. Our goal is to gather as much of this information as we can during the development of the plan so that we can address everybody's needs. Next slide. So for preferred location results, again, somewhat like the other one, we see deployment centers, you know, other types of destinations. Um, the, the three red bars, employment centers came out the high, pretty high. Retail shopping centers came out number one. Uh, parking garages and other and lots like that came out pretty high as well. Um, tourist destinations, parks and recreational areas are pretty high. These are really these are interesting to get because what we're finding out from other states is that this destination-based uh, re regimes um, seem to do pretty well and get a lot more usage. So we're you know if you think about it, you may need a DC fast charger when you're out on the highway. You pull into a rest stop, you know, um, or or you're going to, to eat, you know, on a journey. You want your car to charge fairly pretty fast. So DC fast chargers make sense in those places. Um, other places like multifamily townhouses, um, you know, that's where you're going to be charging overnight. Uh, you may not need the DC fast charger there. So you know, in terms of us developing a program to where we can prioritize um, the awardees, um, then we'll be looking at their applications and seeing if they meet these criteria. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the other questions we asked were where, what corridors did people think were important to them for EV charging? Obviously, I-95 came out number one. Um, just, there's more people located on that corridor. Uh, other ones, I-70 came out pretty high, I-695. The, the one thing we want to note, though, is that the stakeholders who are taking the survey, like I said, primary or a lot of people who work in the industry, local government and others. So we're going to hopefully we'll get more um, folks to take the survey and we can get a more broader base. You can see like I-795, there was only three people thought that was important, but I'm sure there are a lot of people out in that area that think charging is important. Um, but we'll use this uh, material to help us um, formulate a program. So this is the Baltimore area. Move on to the next slide. Uh, Eastern Shore, see US 50s, uh, a popular uh, request for charging stations, US 301, again 995. Next slide, please. Out in Western Maryland, a lot of folks uh, looking at I 68, I 70, and I 81 as important locations. And those are already part of our alternative fuel corridor um, matrix in, in the state. So those corridors are eligible charging stations. Next slide. And Southern Maryland, um, of course, US 301, down through Charles County, La Plata, uh, MD4, down through Calvert County, uh, crossing the Thomas Johnson Bridge over to the MD5 corridor. Those, seem all, those are all popular. And those are the three corridors that we've already got uh, approved in the state as corridor ready alternative. So those quarters will also be helpful for, for funding. Next slide.
And looking around the DC area, obviously I-95, 270, and 495 came out very high, and so did US 50. Um, so did 295. Next slide. Um, so as part of our survey, we've asked folks to put a pin on a map and show us where they think a charger is needed. We got a lot of interest here, a lot of dots put out in Western Maryland. It's going to be very helpful to us. Um, we're also laying this, these maps over our uh, disadvantaged communities analysis that we're doing. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, as a strong component of this plan, we want chargers to get into areas where there aren't chargers now that are rural, that are disadvantaged communities, because they're going to be a top priority for us to get the charging infrastructure out. We want to expand you know, EV ownership in the state. Primarily right now, EV ownership in the state is centered in the higher income areas. And we'd like to see that expanded out. And part of that will be to induce that will be, of course, to get some charging where it's not located now and in communities that need this type of infrastructure. It'll create jobs um, and just make life a little bit easier for someone who wants to get an electric vehicle and doesn't have charging at their house. Okay, next slide. We also asked, uh, we're also asking people in, during our webinars, this is a mentee survey summary that we did, whether they live in a disadvantaged rural community. Now, so the chart on the left, you can see a lot of people said no, they didn't. And of course, that's a reflection of our stakeholders that are invited to these webinars. Um, we've really been using a database of stakeholders that we've had through the years because Maryland's been involved in electric vehicle uh, deployment for a number of years. So this survey uh, question on the left, we want to get that expanded out and we're hoping that when we release the plan and we point people to our website, we'll get more surveys, uh, uh, results that help us um, help us with that. But we're doing a good job, we think, of identifying the disadvantaged communities using census data and showing that at the census track level. And that'll be a major component of our scoring for applications for charger infrastructure. Now, the chart on the right, is there enough information publicly available on EV infrastructure? We think that people who, of course, took the survey know a little bit about this because they're in the industry. Um, and as you can see, there's a large number of people say no or maybe. So we have a lot of education to do. I think nationally, there's a lot of education needed um, to describe and, uh, vehicle electrification, how electric vehicle works, how chargers work. Um, where people can get tax credits for purchasing electric vehicle. Um, they can get tax credits for um, or rebates for installation of EV charging infrastructure in their home. So there's a lot of information that we need to, to get out to folks still. Next slide. Okay, uh, what are our top equity concerns related to EV infrastructure? We asked this during our webinar. Um, home charging didn't come out too high, but it was only three people responded to that. Uh, the cost of charging and the maintenance of stations um, came out very high. And we're hoping to address the cost of charging with our program um, to make it affordable, to make it easily, make it accessible to the disadvantaged communities in the state. Maintenance of stations, of course, came out high too. People don't want to know, people don't want to think that, you know, charging infrastructure is going to come to their neighborhood and because they're a low income or disadvantaged community that that isn't going to be maintained. So applicants seeking formula funds for charging infrastructure are going to have to demonstrate that they can maintain these chargers over a long period of time. Now they'll be owned by the private entities that are awarded the funding. And we see this sort of, you know, a way to get charging infrastructure out quickly into areas where it isn't now and to help uh, sort of grease the wheels in that realm. We know that um, oil companies and other gas station owners are already looking and installing EV charging on their site. So that's coming down the road. But this initial, this initial set of charging applications, we want to make sure we're meeting the equity concerns uh, of the state. Next slide.
Um, again, where do you think charging would be best suited in a disadvantaged community? And some of the criteria offered churches, drawheads, parking lots, retail establishments came up, number one. And so I think a lot of folks are thinking, and, and in the same way that we're thinking as a staff, that you know, a logical place to put out charging of search where it doesn't isn't located now are places where people are stopping and going for their daily activities, and also along those alternative fuel corridors, which is on the national highway system. So for people who are traveling intrastate or interstate that they can get DC fast charging. Um, and that, you know, the idea that you're already stopping in an area at a rest stop where there's food, lodging, other services, that's going to be a place to get some chargers out quickly where they are now, aren't located now. Next. Okay, so uh, how's our website doing? Well, it's only been up a couple months. We've been getting, getting quite, a, quite a few views, we think, for for this subject um, that we haven't had any major press releases, um, but we're reaching out to our, um, our stakeholders that we've identified over the years in the electric vehicle realm, and they're getting the word out to others. Um, our e-blast for the webinars uh, we're sending out, we're getting a lot of traffic on the website right after we send out those e-blasts, um, and we'll send another one out for our, for our upcoming webinar. Um, and that's going to be on uh, Friday, uh, June 10th. And we'll get that information out to everyone that's uh, signed up today for this session. All right, next. So what are our next steps? Again, we go back in time. We launched our MetroQuest survey on March 24th. At our first webinar, March 31st. And at our second webinar on the 28th. Um, on May 13th, we submitted um, our uh, what's called round six nomination for alternative fuel corridors in the state. And those alternative fuel corridors contain two components this year. We've, we've nominated uh, MD200. Um, as a electric vehicle corridor, and we've also nominated the I-95 corridor, including 495 and 695 in Maryland, as a hydrogen fuel corridor. The, uh, our next ZEVIC meeting is uh, on the 26th tomorrow. Um, we've got, a, again, June 10th webinar plan, our third webinar for the plan. And we expect to have our plan released in June and get that out for comment. Um, we may have a fourth webinar, depending on the comments we're getting back. And then, of course, our plans to do the joint office on um, August 1st. And that is the NEVI component of the ZBIT plan. Next slide. So as part of our stakeholder engagement, we set up, uh, for first, we set up an advisory committee or group. Um, that consists of a, just a few state agencies, the Maryland Department of Planning, Maryland Department environment, the Maryland Energy Administration and MDOT. That small group helps us to keep us on track with our plan and our stakeholder engagement and our analysis. So um, as part of our stakeholder engagement, we are actively communicating with and meeting with uh, the Public Service Commission and utilities in the state. We'll be expanding that real soon to get out to the rest of the utilities. We have uh, PGE, we have an Exelon, um, we are going to also do some more reach out with the charging companies and charging manufacturers. So just to put this in context, this is a five-year program. We think that every year we'll go back and sort of look at our plan, evaluate it, see how we're doing, change our program if we need to, depending on how successful we are with the charging deployment. And during that time frame, we are going to continually meet with, with the, the folks who are applying for the funds, basically. Um, and the experts um, in charging infrastructure and those network companies. Well, we also are going to do uh, a lot of work in reaching out to disadvantaged communities and their uh, representatives. And part of that has already started now, of course, with the webinars. And we're going to we have a lot of robust analysis that you know, people will see in our plan. And we started getting feedback back 
I think we're going to end up with some some meetings, some so a lot more meetings with with those communities, and we're going to track how we're doing. So, like I said, we're going to update the plan every year and continually evaluate the deployment of the charging infrastructure to make sure we're meeting our goals. Automakers and other uh, entities are also there. Um, planning partners, which include the counties in the state, um, other planning agencies, the metropolitan planning organizations. We're gonna do more reach out to them and coordinate with them. And we think with the metropolitan planning organizations, there are gonna be opportunities to um, coordinate with them on the success of the program. And also coming in the fall, um, when we find out about the discretionary program, other charging program I mentioned in the beginning. The MPOs and those other planning partners, they're going to be eligible to apply for that on their own, not through the state. So um, they're going to want the information to see how we're doing so that then they apply for the funds, um, they get what they want, they get what they need, and, and they're successful. Um, potential site hosts, we may be meeting with some of those too. Um, we think as part of our application process, the applicants will have to come into to MDOT showing that they have a site host agreement, uh, that they have the power available, because it's gonna take, a, again, that 600 kilowatt minimum power requirement. Um, so there'll be a lot of hoops, I would say, uh, but we wanna make those hoops as easy uh, to get through as we can. We understand that, you know, a whole private partnership or a private entity that applies for charging infrastructure funds to uh, put it on a site in, in any one of the counties, you're probably gonna have to do some sort of planning process or, or, or permit process there too. So we wanna make sure that those processes um, are working for them and, and working for everybody to get the charging infrastructure. Next slide. Again, um, we're gonna uh, do a lot more in terms of our public education and outreach. You know, to date, we've had 25 events we've attended over the years because them has been involved in electrification of vehicles, uh, zero emission vehicles for, for several years. Um, reached out to at least 7,000 people. And uh, we're also developing, we're gonna be developing and continue to develop um, information in other languages as needed. Next page. Okay, so as part of our analysis for our disadvantaged community analysis and our location-based tool, um, it, there are two, I guess it's, it's, it, it is the location-based tool is the way to describe this, but it does contain these components. Um, first of all, for the EV infrastructure, the charging stations have to meet the, the Federal Highway DOT uh, uh, Department of Energy criteria. Um, again, there's the one mile buffer. This is on the left here under EV infrastructure. Um, we're gonna be looking, well, we may look at the, the number of vehicles on those roads, see what the potential is to maximize the use of the chargers. And of course, they're gonna be on interstate US routes, state routes. Um, there is interest, is, there is interest in the counties in getting more charging infrastructure on local county roads and on state roads in the county that are part, not part of the national highway system. And we'll have to look at those closely in the coming years and uh, see how you'll see how many charges are already on those corridors um, and find out if the counties or the cities are actually going for the discretionary funding to get charging out there on their own. So we're all sort of working together for the same goal. Um, we're looking at land use um, information as well. What type of land use, of course. Um, under the socioeconomic um, section here, um, we're looking at historical disadvantaged communities, we're looking at household income, um, single family um, households, um, households that are um, where they're, where they're single mothers, perhaps. Um, but we, so we want to know who the charging infrastructure is helping. And we don't, we certainly don't want our program to avoid these areas and miss out on an opportunity to help this managed community. The Justice 40 initiative um, is part of this where 40% of the federal funds should be spent in these disadvantaged communities. So we want to make that happen. Um, and it's going to be a primary emphasis of our, of our program. 
Um, existing outreach, of course, we've had our local government survey uh, in the past. Um, we have our ZBIG meetings, which are ongoing, um, and we have our survey, uh, our MetroQuest survey that we put out for this ZBIG plan itself uh, to get information like optimal locations for charging infrastructure. Um, other areas that may be eligible and we're looking at are, you know, transit-oriented developments, priority funding areas, um, intermodal transportation facilities, um, where there are substations, uh, where there's power, uh, where bike lanes, uh, where they're available, um, transit stops, and also registered EV ownership. So we have a lot of metrics we're, we're using to develop our location-based tools. Next screen. Other considerations we want to look at, you know, rural areas, if there isn't the power available for DC fast charging, um, maybe there's power there for another level of charging, and maybe that power uh, would come from a solar um, canopy or some other method. Mobile charging, we're also interested in looking at, at getting some of those. Um, we have uh, trucks, you know, from the State Highway Administration that carry different types of fuel to help people who are stalled on the road, and we're looking at putting uh, mobile charging on those fleets so we can help stranded motorists and anybody else who needs a charge who's, you know, sort of stuck stuck somewhere without a charger. Um, other considerations uh, for the match. So the funding that's coming down is 80% um, federal, 20% uh, local match, and we're going to look at creative ways to make that match work. Um, this is a significant um, assistance to those public-private partnerships or private entities that will be applying for the funds, and uh, we want to make sure that that money goes uh, it is used the most efficiently as possible. Um, also, other things are there amenities nearby. Um, we'll make sure there's lighting and it's safe at these um, charging points. And if there are other amenities like we've described before, we're looking at the land use. So when an application comes in, we'll have a lot of criteria to review for each application. And we're going to set up a, probably set up a committee uh, comprised of MDOT employees, Maryland Energy Administration, and others that we've identified to help us uh, review applications for completeness, um, either send them back, uh, to go through the process again or take them forward to a committee for approval or denial um, and we may send it back to the applicant have them redo it if they have to but we want to meet every month because it's going to be we kind of think it's going to be an ongoing program we're not going to have windows um, it's just going to be we'll be reviewing them every month so we think we'll have a continual stream of applications coming in and we're going to look at all these considerations that we've described before on this page Next slide. Okay, well, again, my name is Dan Janicek, uh, Maryland Department of Transportation, uh, Planning and Capital Programming. Um, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, I'm also working with Rebecca Banker. Um, she is an um, uh, integral part of our staff. She's works with Baker and Associates, but she's here at MDOT. And of course, we have another contact there. It's Mike Jones at the Maryland Energy Administration. Those contacts are listed. On our website uh, with our webinars that we posted and i can put that in the chat here a little bit so you guys can have access to it so uh, i guess we'll turn it back over to, to you gladys okay great thanks dan so i'm actually going to tack a little bit of time to this just to take a couple of questions that anybody has so make sure to type your questions in the question window and i think we're just going to go dive right into it so Dan, we have a couple of employers online and some of them are sharing that they have Tesla chargers available uh, at their place of business for customers. If they were interested in having other types of electric vehicle chargers similar to the ones at BWI, what's the process for them to get one of those? Is that through MDOT? Yeah, the process for the NEVI form of the funding will be through MDOT. And we'll be announcing those program parameters later in the year. Uh, our first step is to get our plan approved by the joint office and then to uh, stand up our program. So if you look at keep, 
keep an eye out on our website here. Keep an eye out on MDOT's website, Planning Capital Programming page. Um, in those areas, and we'll probably have some press releases by then too. So that knowledge will be out there. We'll stand up that program. And if you have Tesla chargers on your site now, and you want some more chargers, and you are working with a charging company or somebody who has a demonstrated capability to install, operate, maintain the chargers, and you're an el uh, then then you're eligible for to apply. Um, we are the eligible entity to receive the funds at MDOT. The highway, but again, the funds are going to be primarily well. There's a couple of parameters; they have to be for public, publicly accessible charging. We're looking at passenger vehicles. They um, um, can be applied for again by partnerships that include an entity, usually a private company, who's got the experience and capability to maintain and own and operate. Because they're going to the ownership will not be by MDOT. That's not going to Give the charging out to someone, I give the dollars out to someone to install charging and own it. That would be owned by uh, the applicants. Okay, and once you get to the maintenance of these stations, do you know if it's actually going to be something that is going to be um, accomplished by the use of contractors or is or is MDOT going to have staff to, well, to do the maintenance? No, the maintenance will be, um, the maintenance will be on the, oh, folks who are awarded the program funds and installing it because they're going to own it. So they'll have to give us a maintenance plan and have show us to demonstrate that they've operated and maintained charging stations in the past. Um, again, um, the folks will be receiving the money, you know, if they're, they're getting 80% of their um, costs covered by the federal government. So um, we feel like uh, that's, that's quite a, <laughs> That's quite a large um, um, enticement uh, to a company to apply for the funds, and uh, it will be on them to maintain them. So there'll be some clauses in the contracts if they're not maintained. Um, I'm not sure how we'll handle reverse ownership, but um, it, it, but again, the, the maintenance will be on the, the folks who are awarded the funds and, and installing and owning. Okay, and this kind of goes hand in hand with maintenance. Uh, once the charging stations are in place, do you know yet what sort of security options are going to be um, taken into consideration to protect these stations? Well, I guess that will be in their applications. It'll have to be a component um, that we'll review for that aspect. So, you know, if, if, if we require a site plan, um, you know, we're going to be looking at things like access to this charging station, um, whether they, you know, how they control parking, uh, who's sitting and parking in, in, in the charging bay, lighting, and those types of things. So I think those will sort of be addressed through some sort of site plan uh, evaluation and location. We're obviously going to look at the location. Um, but, you know, the folks who are interested who are emailing us now are like 7-Eleven, Royal Farms. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's not out of the question for a local government to say, well, we need some charging at our library. And we're going to hook up with the charging company and apply for some of these funds and get some DC fast chargers at our local library. You know, we're just going to need to see a sort of a site plan to show where they go. Right. Um, but since they'll be privately owned and mostly owned, private land or public land. Um, and the idea, of course, is not to have these on the middle of nowhere. So, you know, safety is going to be an integral part of our review process. I'm not sure if you have the answer for this one, Dan, but there is a workforce development question for, I guess, um, an employer on this call who's interested in possibly learning more about what training would be required to maintain these stations to kind of uh, get her staff prepared for possible work in the future. Where can yeah. she learn more about this workforce uh, training or development for this type of uh, for this type of infrastructure? Yeah, if we could get their contact information, we could we could probably give them some inf information. There are apprenticeship programs in the state of Maryland, and um, we also see that uh, again, uh, people who are awarded the funds that are working with a company who has a demonstrated experience capability, they'll be charging their own, they'll be training their own staff. Um, 
And in terms of electric vehicles, um, we do know that companies like Toyota, for instance, have uh, dealerships in the region, and they choose a couple of those where they do their training for their employees. I don't know if they reach out, but there are, again, there are apprenticeship programs out there uh, in Maryland um, that are uh, training people in this area. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. Well, that's really all the time that we have today, folks. I really appreciate everybody who's able to hang on with us till the end. Um, all of the slides and also this webinar recording will be available on our website, commuterchoicemaryland.com, so be sure to check that out for this recording and maybe um, some of our other recordings that we have. Webinars are administered regularly on a quarterly basis, so be sure to check in for other interesting topics. And if you don't already, please follow and like us on LinkedIn and Facebook. We thank you for your time and have a great rest of your afternoon.